Good evening. Um, I'm Nicole Ruane from the Department of Classics, Humanities, and Italian Studies, and I'd like to welcome you to the second lecture in the Sal Osador Memorial Lecture Series for the 2017-2018 academic year. This year, the series addresses the question, who owns the past? It explores the importance of cultural heritage and questions who has the responsibility and the prerogative to control it. And actually, before I forget, I'd like to ask you to turn off your cell phones um, at this time, if you have not already. <clears throat> as you may know, the Sador series is sponsored by UNH's Center for the Humanities, as well as the family of Saul O. Sador. I and the other co-conveners of this year's series would like to thank the center, especially Bert Feintuck and Katie Umans, um, for their support and help. And we'd also like to thank the Sador series, uh, Sador family for sponsoring this important series. I'll remind us that the next lecture, the third lecture, will be on Monday, November 20th at 7 p.m. when our speaker, Omar Harmansha of the University of Illinois at Chicago, will discuss the topic, Disposable Landscapes, Disposable Heritage, Politics of the Ancient Past and the Anthropocene. Tonight's speaker is Professor Jesse Kasana who is Associate Professor of Anthropology at Dartmouth College. He is an archeologist who specializes in the study of the Middle East. His research investigates settlement and land use history, the emergence and development of complex societies and the dynamic interactions of humans with their environment. Professor Kasana's projects explore large reason, regions, embrace long periods of human history and employ a wide range of technologies. Professor Kasana earned his BA at the University of Texas at Austin and his MA and PhD in archeology span from the University of Chicago. He has taught at the University of Kansas and has been at Dartmouth since 2015. Much of Professor Kasana's research is dedicated to the development and implementation of geospatial technologies in archeology, span <clears throat> primarily using satellite, low altitude, aerial, and ground-based remote sensing. He currently directs the Corona Atlas Project, an effort to make Cold War era spy satellite imagery available to researchers through an online database. He is also closely involved with the American Schools of Oriental Research as he co-directs their Cultural Heritage Initiative, a project sponsored in part by the US State Department. In this initiative, he oversees satellite imagery-based analysis of damage from combat looting and international, uh, intentional destruction to archaeological sites in Syria and northern Iraq. Professor Kasana is also <clears throat> a principal investigator for the National Science Foundation-funded Spatial Archaeometry Research Collaborations Program, or SPARC, based at the University of Arkansas. Until the start of the Syrian Civil War, for many years he directed excavations at the Syrian site of Tel Karkar. Um, these were sponsored by the American Schools of Oriental Research. He is currently the co-director of a regional archaeological survey project in the upper Diyala or Sirwan Valley, River Valley in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. And he collaborates on field projects elsewhere in the Middle East, as well as in North America. Um, including New Mexico along the Mississippi River, and I just found out at the Enfield Shaker Grounds. <clears throat> Professor Kasana is the author of many archaeological reports, journal articles, and book chapters. He has recently been the guest editor for the journal uh, Near Eastern Archaeology in its special volume of the Cultural Heritage Crisis in the Middle East. His work is of interest to many people outside of the specialized field of archaeology. It has been the subject of many articles, not only by specialists, but in newspapers, magazines, and other popular media. Professor Cassano will be speaking us tonight on the to us tonight on the topic, Satellite Monitoring of Archaeological Damage and Looting in the Syrian Civil War. We are very pleased to have him. Please help me in welcoming him. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Nicole, for that kind uh, introduction. It sounds a lot more important than I feel. Um, it's great to be back here in Durham. I uh, actually lived here for two years, um, between the ages of one and two. <laughs> My father was a master's student here. Um, so anyway, I don't remember much, but it seems nice. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so I'm going to be, uh, I, and I want to apologize. I just noticed that in my haste to make the title of my slide match the advertised title of the talk, I made a typo, so don't look too closely. But look instead at the image below it, um, which shows a satellite image of an, a very large and kind of famous archaeological site that's today located in far eastern Syria on the Euphrates River. It's known as Mari. It was a, a big political capital during the Bronze Age back in the third and second millennium BC. Um, and uh, it was excavated you know, over 100 years ago by a big French mission, all kinds of statues and cuneiform tablets and stuff. So it's kind of much known and loved to the world of archaeology. Um, this is one of many sites in Syria that in the course of the current conflict there has been uh, devastatingly looted. Um, and so the what you can see there, do I, I don't have a pointer, do I? That's one thing I didn't think of. Well, I will be okay. Um, look, I'll just go like this. No, that won't work. Anyway, whatever. All of these uh, little pockmark um, crater looking things, those are all looting holes that surround the so-called palace of Zimrilim on this uh, site. And this is one of many, many hundreds of sites that have been damaged like this in the course of the conflict that serves as the basis for what I'll be kind of discussing tonight. I should also clarify that I'm no longer actually co-directing that project. So my efforts that I'm mostly presenting tonight were sponsored by the State Department through about a year ago. And then uh, we've continued to do a little work since. But um, you know, it was kind of a two-year funded effort. So um, I still continue to work, though, on this topic. So my, my interest in doing this, uh, trying to look at the damage to archaeological sites that w have happened because of the war in Syria, is something I came by honestly. As Nicole mentioned, I had previously run an excavation at a big archaeological site in western Syria called Tel Karkur. It's pictured here, that big hill you see kind of in the distance on the top there. That is the mounded remains of this big archaeological site. If you're not familiar with the archaeology of the Middle East, a lot of the ancient towns and cities of that region form these big mounds that are deeply stratified with layers and layers of occupation. And then they also contain all kinds of artifacts from the people that used to live there. So in the excavation that I was running, you know, we would go every summer for six or seven years, and we worked closely with the people who lived there. We had a large team of locals that excavated for us. That guy on the left, Hassan, used to watch my kids. Like, you know, we were uh, very close with these people and knew them well and knew the place well. This is something about archaeology. You spend a lot of time on the ground. You get to know the, the people and the place and things in a sort of intimate way. And so as soon as the war happened, I was really beside myself. Like, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. All cell phone coverage and internet access for these people was cut off. Um, we had no idea what had become of them, nor what had happened to our extensive collections or the sites themselves. I mean, this excavation had been going on for like 20 years, and that involves an enormous amount of material and all kinds of tools. We have a whole facility filled with boxes and boxes stacked to the ceiling of artifacts. And so anyway, this is like a big question mark. Uh, I was supposed to go in 2011 when the war began, we had a whole team ready to ship out. And then uh, the war started to get bad right that spring. And so then we had to cancel it. And then we just never went back. So a couple years later, I got it in my head that we should probably try to figure out what was going on there through some other method. Because up until then, the information that had been available regarding the archaeological sites and other things inside Syria was extremely meager in the early years of the war. The only reports that we'd get of this were from journalists sometimes, but they're not archaeologists, and they often didn't know what they were looking at. Like, they wouldn't have known that that last slide was an archaeological site. It's just a hill to them, you know. Um, or they were on social media, like these images pictured here, where people would take pictures of certain things happening, and we'd see them. Um, in this particular case, there was um, a woman over at Durham called Emma Kunliff who <coughs> wrote a little study on the sort of media coverage and what could be determined from that of the damaged archaeological sites. And one um, report that occurred was when there was a, a military conflict at this 
well-known Roman period and also later crusader site in Western Syria called Apamea, where the Syrian military had attacked and there was these explosions. This just happened to be a site that I knew pretty well because in my years there, it was about an hour from the place where I used to work. So every summer we'd go visit, people would see the columns and take a tour of the citadel. It was like a, an outing. So I knew exactly where those pictures that you saw were, and I was very curious what was going on there. And it was right after the posting of that information that this same site uh, was noticed by some other people to have been ex looted in a very intensive way. And that was made most evident through satellite images that were posted on Google Earth, just mm -hmm. randomly. Um, here, this shows a uh, Google Earth image from July 2011 of the city of Apamea with its citadel and its colonnaded street and the city wall. Um, and so what happened is that sometime between July of 2011 and the time when the next image was posted on Google Earth uh, in April 2012, a big part of that central site was very badly looted. Google Earth, in case you haven't used it much, has this little time slider icon where you can look at images from the past. Whenever they buy a new image, they kind of slap it up there on the website. So you tend to see the most recent one, but the older ones that they've bought are visible too. And so that was the first way that we saw this. Zooming in a little bit on this central part of the mound, you can see um, here in that July 2011 image, up on the upper left, you can see the little bits of that colonnaded street. By you know nine months later, this whole thing was really, really badly looted. And so this is what caught a lot of media attention initially as like, whoa, Apamea has been terribly looted. Um, as someone who spent a lot of time there, though, I noticed some other things about this looting that I thought was kind of strange. Notably, it was that um, there's this street that runs down in the middle of the site, and on the left side of the slide, there's uh, an area of the site that's privately owned and currently cultivated, as is common with large archaeological sites. They're huge, and so you know people farm them sometimes. On the other side is the part of the site that's owned by the Syrian government. And what was obvious is that the looting was only on the government-owned part of the site, which made me suspicious about what the hell was going on here. It wasn't like random looting. It was very targeted to a specific part of the site, that is, the part that the government owned. Over the subsequent couple of years, an increasingly large part of Apamea was continually looted and they started to move slowly outwards into that private area, but in a very organized grid-like way, which again makes it seem like it's been organized. And it's not hard to see what the organization is. In this case, the southern part of the site had a very large Syrian regime military base that was built on top of the site and occupied throughout this period of looting. Sort of, you know, fairly clear that the Syrian military in this case was either involved with the looting or at least uh, you know turning a blind eye to it going on adjacent to their bunker. So um, seeing that happen, I decided to do a study of this stuff and it was very hard at the time to get many people to support it financially. So I mostly relied on freely donated imagery and whatever was available through Google Earth or other web mapping sites. We did a study of a few dozen of the most famous archaeological sites in Syria using a variety of these image sources just to try to document what kind of damage was going on at them using that same kind of method, looking at a time series of different images and trying to see when that damage had occurred and what kinds of damage we could see. And this was a um, kind of eye-opening study for me because what it showed is that, first of all, almost every single site in our study had some form of damage, some of it looting, like at Apamea, but also a lot of other things were going on. We saw, for instance, the creation of big military bunkers on top of sites. Oftentimes, sites like the one that's pictured at the lower part of this slide, a little mound near Apamea that is of not particular note. It's called Tel Jafar, but it's a big mound like the one that I used to excavate. And these kinds of mounds are often targeted by military commanders as a place that you might want to fortify because they're naturally high strategic points in the landscape. That's often why they were settled in the first place and fortified in antiquity. And so they you know, continue to be fortified today. Anyway, in this case, we have another case of the Syrian military occupying the site and subsequently a large amount of looting appearing. So 
Anyway, we did this kind of work a lot, and it, it was clear that there was a lot of damage going on in these sites. And to me, a very sad fact that it was also actually at my site, the site that I was excavating at, we saw this similar kind of damage going on at. This shows the northern end of Tel Karkur in June of 2010. I particularly like this image because I'm in it. I'm a little hard to see, but this was taken overhead during our lunch break while we were on site, so that was interesting. Um, uh, so you can see in it our excavation areas and our tent and our bus and so forth, they're there. Um, but then uh, about a year later, the top of that site was uh, kind of bulldozed to make way for a series of tank emplacements as the site was fortified during the early years of intense conflict in that region. Um, we'll come back to Karkor in a minute because it's not had an easy time throughout the rest of this war. But it was basically that pilot study, right, that really got me interested in trying to do that same kind of work, but on a much bigger scale. Because I was only looking at a few dozen sites, right, and using a very meager amount of imagery, basically whatever I could find for free or beg and borrow from people. In fact, there's a ton of satellite imagery out there that exists, and also tens of thousands of archaeological sites in this region. And basically, we had no idea how severe this problem was, uh, how many sites were getting looted or bulldozed, where those sites were located in terms of their proximity to population centers or in what areas of factional control, whether part of the Syrian regime or under ISIS, which, okay, didn't exist at the time yet. But anyway, we didn't know like anything. It was like a complete blank as far as the information about it. And so it was, it was into that sort of, um, black hole of data that uh, this large project that I became a part of was initiated. It was originally called the Syrian Heritage Initiative. It was later changed to the Cultural Heritage Initiatives, mostly because the war extended into northern Iraq, and so it seemed unfair to just stick with Syria. Um, this was a, a grant proposal, a, a call for proposals that was put out by the US Department of State. Their Near Eastern Bureau had an interest in trying to also find out what was going on with the cultural heritage in the war and also make planning for different kinds of mitigation. I understand one of your speakers later in this series is going to be my colleague Mike Dante, who's uh, currently the academic director for the project. And he'll talk a lot more about the bigger goals of it. And there's a lot of good work that that's, they've been doing as part of the cultural heritage initiative. My own role in that, though, was basically just to do the same kind of study I had done previously, except on a much bigger scale. And with the resources that the State Department made available, that became possible for the first time. The most important thing that they got for me, like to make the kind of study that I wanted to do possible was basically access to satellite imagery. And this is like, th that was the biggest problem for me, is that like there is tons of satellite imagery out there that is available to you if you happen to have unlimited resources. There are these private imaging companies, the biggest one being the company called Digital Globe. They operate a couple of high-resolution imaging satellites that are effectively public, um, GOI, Worldview, and some others you might have heard of or not. Um, anybody with a credit card can go on their website and buy that imagery, right, if you have, but it's very expensive. It's going to cost you something like 100 bucks a square kilometer. So to do the kind of study that I wanted to do where you need multiple images over potentially thousands of sites would have cost literally millions of dollars in imagery purchase. So that was like clearly not going to happen. Um, however, the thing is that more than 90% of Digital Globe's business comes from the military of the United States and other federal agencies. Basically, it is more or less like a privatized military satellite. And what that means is that other people working with or through the federal government can get access to that entire archive of imagery, which is what we got. And so suddenly we had this kind of backdoor access to all the imagery we could eat. And because this was a war zone, uh, Digital Globe was c collecting new imagery of parts of Syria and northern Iraq on a daily basis, and they continue to do so. And the, every time they collect those images, they post them on this image service website, and we can view them, download them, and basically use them at will. And that, for me, really radically changed the potential of what we could 
do in terms of monitoring, both spatially, so we could monitor more sites, but also we could monitor sites much more rapidly, like we could see what's going on in near real time. Um, this project began in the summer of 2014, and it just so happened that that was the same summer when ISIS invaded uh, the city of Mosul and took large parts of what's today northern Iraq. Uh, at the time that this happened, I was actually in the city of Erbil in uh, northern Iraq, just about an hour away from Mosul. We were all a little nervous, um, so we left. Uh, but as part of this um, invasion into northern Iraq, uh, the group that had already become sort of famous for their destruction intentionally of heritage sites, particularly things like Shia shrines and other sort of modern religious monuments, but also some ancient or historical sites. Um, they also, in this conquest, came into possession of some of the most significant archaeological sites in Iraq. And that led the cultural heritage community to kind of become very concerned about the potential for more extreme damage. And so, the satellite imagery, in one way, has simply helped us to kind of track damage that's occurring at key sites like these. And this is something that's ongoing and is an important part of it. One good example of this is the site that we today call Nimrud. This was um, one of the signature sites of Mesopotamian archaeology, the capital of the Neo-Assyrian Empire back during the uh, uh, 8th, 9th century BC. Um, the site was originally mapped by Austin Henry Layard in 1845, one of the very first archaeological sites to be recognized in this region and one of the first excavations to be undertaken. On the bottom, you can see a, a illustration of his excavation of the large stone monuments that are recovered from these um, sort of iconic sites. These things are now on display at museums all over the world at the Met. Um, down in New York, at the British Museum, at the University of Chicago, the Louvre, and in fact, even a few of them at our own Hood Museum up in Hanover, where um, several of these relief panels that Layard excavated are now on display, or, well, the museum's been renovated. They're still in there, but you can't see them until March. Anyway, they'll be back up soon. Um, all of these relief panels and big stone architecture and stuff come from this one sort of amazing palace, the so-called Northwest Palace of the Assyrian King Ashur Nasirpal, down in the lower left there. And it was at this palace that in uh, 2015, uh, Isis, while in possession of the site and its region, um, posted these uh, videos online showing, first of all, them lining the, the chambers of the palace with what remained of the stone orthostats, those carved stone things with uh, these large barrels. These are barrel bombs. And then they posted a video of the site being demolished. The thing is that these videos are very hard to confirm and um, they can be faked or, you know, there's, and we don't necessarily know for sure what's going on in the image or uh, when it occurred or exactly how severe it is. I mean, the, and we have to remember also that these ISIS films are, are not, like objective reporting of what's happening. These are propaganda films where they are putting it out on the internet to brag about what's happening. You know, so um, in this case, the satellite image really helped to like confirm exactly what was going on on the ground in a place where no one could actually go visit. Um, and so in this time series that was put together by my colleagues at ASOR, uh, you can see a February, 26, 2015 image with the palace intact, and then an April 2015 image where they have started to uh, bulldoze or you know make certain pathways through the thing, probably getting ready for it. And sometime over that 17-day period that separates those two images on the right, the palace was demolished. So you know we can see exactly what happened and when it happened and so forth. So it's sad, but um, a useful thing that the imagery does. And the same is true for the site of Palmyra, which has been in the news a lot, so I thought worth mentioning, where uh, this well-known temple of Balshamin, one of many sort of iconic monuments that are found in Palmyra, or were, uh, were intentionally destroyed by ISIS during the time when they took it over in 2015. Um, in this case, this temple was completely destroyed 
and we can see that again clearly through analysis of the satellite imagery, where sometime between June and September of 2015, the temple is present, and then it's not. Um, a lot of hay was made of the so-called liberation of Palmyra the following March in 2016, when the Russian and Syrian military came in and took it over and forced ISIS out, which was good, but um, less reported is the ongoing threat that was caused by the presence of the Russian military. In this case, we're looking at the northern end of the city of Palmyra. There's like a, a dark line with little crenellations on it on the bottom, and if you can see, that's the Roman period city wall of Palmyra. And then above it, with all those like kind of whole dark looking things, those are actually the remains of the necropolis or the large sort of monumental burial grounds. And there's no modern houses built on that area today. Those are at the very top and very right of the site because it's part of the heritage site. It's a you know, protected archeological site. But when the Russians came in, so there's the, yeah, there's the city wall and there's the necropolis. When the Russians came in, they built this giant like military base right on top of it. Like it was so convenient. I guess it was right. They were like, look at this great. Anyway, this, this is just to show that the threats to cultural heritage and conflict are not so easily described. Like it's, it's um, a lot of bad stuff. Okay, so these are just cases basically in which we're able to say, okay, this particular site that we know about or that we heard about through some other source, we can then look at the imagery and sort of verify its damage or not. What I was really more interested in doing though with this resource is trying to make a broader assessment about the severity of this issue across the whole region. Like with these data, we could actually not just look at one or two sites, we could look at like thousands of sites. So this map, for example, shows all of the known and mapped archeological sites in Syria and Southern Turkey, Northern Iraq. I had put this together previously as part of a different research project where we got together like every archeological site that was known already to exist, like that had been published in books or whatever. And then we meticulously went through all kinds of satellite imagery to find all of the things that looked like sites that we could see, but which hadn't been previously recorded. And together we came up with a very large data set. So inside Syria, something like 12,000 sites or something. So it was a whole bunch, like a lot of these. Um, about a third of those being already published and two thirds not published at all and just kind of unknown. So a whole bunch of sites. And that's first of all the basis for it. So I know where the sites are at least. And for many of them, I know something about them. Uh, so what I decided to do is put together a, an effort to sort of sample this data set. So we were gonna pick some subset of this many, many thousands of sites and begin a process of analyzing them systematically to look for a full range of different kinds of damage and then log them into a database in a way that we could query it, right? Because what we wanna be able to do is ask questions about the patterning spatially or temporally in damage. We wanna see like, okay, just think of like a basic question. Like, uh, was there more looting in ISIS-controlled areas than other parts of Syria? Like, this is a sort of important question, right? But like, there's no way to actually answer that question without this kind of information. Or we can look for all kinds of things. We can say, look at the uh, relationship between looting and military occupation. Like, how common is it for sites that are occupied by military forces in the way that we can document, to also be looted. Like, is that frequent? Is it not frequent? Does looting occur near population centers? Is it correlated with zones of more intense conflict? Um, how does that change over time? Like, these are questions that we can answer. So uh, that was like my goal, was to try to like develop a means by which we could analyze these sites systematically and subsequently query the data set in order to answer these kinds of questions. Um, we developed a system in which all of the satellite images that Digital Globe posts, so all the tons of imagery that they're constantly collecting, could be streamed directly into our ArcGIS run database. We then have analysts, and when I say analysts, what I mean is like me and three or four grad students who are poorly paid and yet somehow dedicated to doing this. So we would sit there and just methodically go through 
a sample of the sites, doing as many as we could in as much time as we had. <clears throat> For each site, we look at an image of the archaeological site and then whatever other imagery is available going back into the past. And particularly, we'd compare imagery from before the war to imagery that's been taken since the war. Uh, so the most recent image we could find with some pre-war, like 2010 or earlier image, to say, has this site been damaged during the war? And then we'd also log whether that site was damaged previous to the war. So if we see, say, for instance, looting at an archaeological site in a satellite image from 2010, then we know that that site has just been a place where people like to loot. Sometimes people go out on the weekends and loot. You know, it's just a thing. <clears throat> So um, for each of these sites, we would then record all these different forms of damage in the data set. Uh, so in this case, looking at that little site that I showed before, Tel Jafar, we can say, well, okay, this site has a military garrison on it. It has been bulldozed on the side. Um, it has a whole crap ton of looting on the south end of the site. And so we can record all of these different um, categories of damage with severity and so forth. Um, Ultimately, over the couple years that we were um, supported to do this work, we analyzed almost 5,000 sites uh, spread out across this. In year one, we focused mostly on getting like the better known sites done because people really wanted to know if the site they were digging or the site that they went on vacation or at was being damaged. In the subsequent years of the project, we started focusing instead just on areas wherever more recent imagery was available. Imagery available is, a real, is, is an issue. Like, it's not as if all of Syria is imaged every day. You know, what we get is a whole bunch of images. Like, I guarantee you right now, Digital Globe is collecting imagery like every few hours in Raqqa, right? But maybe if Raqqa becomes a peaceful place and is taken by the Kurds, then no one will take an image of Raqqa for the next three years. And then we'll get another. So this happens a lot. So we get like a whole bunch of imagery when a particular region is really in the news and when there's a lot of conflict. And then we might have several years without any. Um, so we had, we're focusing on areas where, where we could see more recent damage. Um, and uh, we also decided as a comparative data set to extend our work outside of Syria into northern Iraq to look at both ISIS and non-ISIS controlled parts of Iraq. And also, as a control, parts of um, southern Turkey and a little bit in Lebanon, too. Um, I want to show a few examples of the kinds of things we found in this effort. <clears throat> Some of them are pretty famous sites that have been very devastatingly looted. A good example being the well-known um, sort of Hellenistic and Roman city of Dura Europus on the Euphrates River in eastern Syria. Um, this site originally actually came to prominence uh, in 1920, all again during a conflict, it was the Arab Revolt, which happened in the years following World War I. They were revolting against British rule in Mesopotamia. And um, James Henry Breasted, an archaeologist from the University of Chicago, was on a crazy mission to drive across the Middle East and just happened to be there as the British forces were retreating, had one day to frantically run around and record a bunch of uh, frescoes and other finds from the site, um, which were actually exposed from the digging of military bunkers in the site. So there's a long history of conflict at this place. Um, <clears throat> more recently, in 2013, the Syrian Antiquities Authority, the DGAM, it's called, um, reported illegal digging. Uh, and then, um, so in the satellite imagery, though, we can see all of this going on. This shows an image from August 2011, so just at the start of the war. Um, you can see the outline of the city wall and the Euphrates River at the top of the slide. <clears throat> uh, by some years later, in 2015, almost the entirety of the site has been extremely badly looted with all those little holes. We're going to zoom in here on an area uh, known as the Palmyrene Gate, because it is a gateway that goes towards Palmyra. A thing that's interesting, though, in this case is that we actually have a very long history of pre-war looting. So all those like dark little spots that look sort of Swiss cheesy, that is all looting holes that are some of them decades old. So this is a place where people have been like looting and looting and looting because, you know, it's a big famous site. They find coins and gold and glass, whatever. And then they, they go back and they loot the, I mean, a lot of these looting holes are actually 
inside old looting holes, which I think must have been a disappointing looting hole for whoever, whoever dug that one. Um, yeah, anyway, a lot of, uh, lot of looting at, at Dura, unfortunately. Um, other sites we see, uh, this is a good example. Um, Nicole mentioned my Corona imagery project. A lot of the site database was actually built by analysis of this old 1960s spy satellite imagery, which is great for recognizing sites. This is a big site in western central Syria called Kinnisreen or Calchas in the Roman period. And there you can see there's this big city wall that surrounded a mounded area. And almost all of that ancient city has today been built over by the modern town. This kind of process has been destroying sites much more vociferously than anything related to the war, but most people ignore it. Anyway, the mound itself is um, particularly badly damaged. You can see here in December of 2011, um, uh, a mostly undamaged mound, but like with a couple of little looting holes on it, uh, probably just people from the village going up there and trying their luck. It's like buying a lottery ticket. You just uh, And a lot of the looting that we document is of this type, is of sort of aspirational looting by a small group of people, a few holes here and there. And that's the kind of thing that is, um, you know, to be expected in a conflict like this. Uh, much worse is when you start seeing a lot more looting. So in this case, by 2014, the extent of looting had really expanded. Down on the southern end, you can see they seem like they found something good there or something, and dug a whole bunch of holes into it. Um, and this process has continued to get worse over the course of the war. When it's really been damaged even more, though, is with the militarization of the site. So this image from February of 2017 shows these lines of trenching across the mound, the fortification of its southern side, and then uh, extensive looting across the whole thing. So, uh, and this is a pattern that we see at many sites, sites that started with a little bit of looting, we see that loot and expand, and then if a military occupation occurs at the site, which is quite common, then um, all bets are off. Um, so anyway, doing this kind of analysis on um, the 5,000 sites or so in our database, we're able to make some sort of spatial queries about where and how severe looting is taking place. This map, for example, shows all of the pre-war looting that we've been able to document. So something like, you know, um, everything that occurred prior to uh, the beginning of the war in spring of 2011. <clears throat> you can see there's quite a lot of looting. I mean, looting is something that is going on a lot in Syria for many decades. Um, since the war, the nature of that looting, though, has you know, intensified considerably and also shifted sort of north and west into more populous regions. And this is probably because in the past, looting was illegal, right? And so if you were caught looting, it was like a big deal. You go to jail and blah, blah, blah. So with the breakdown of civil authority, a lot of people who previously maybe were afraid to loot were no longer. And so we see a lot of looting extending into more anarchic parts of Syria in particular, but also more populated parts with more archeological sites. The thing about the war-related looting that to me though was so striking is that um, it's very country specific. So uh, the national borders make a huge difference. So in Syria, we have quite a lot of looting. So more than 13% of the sites in our sample inside Syria ha um, have been looted in the past few years in the course of this war. You have to remember, that's a big number, right? Because there's like, I don't know, 10, 20,000 sites in Syria. So we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, <clears throat> however, in Turkey, Almost nothing, six of the more than 400 sites that we sampled had any evidence of it. And in northern Iraq, it's like, like I think we had two or something out of more than 800 sites that we analyzed in northern Iraq, which is a shocking number, especially when compared to the really intense looting akin to like what we see in Syria that went on in southern Iraq, especially in the years following the 2003 Gulf War, and really in years since. <clears throat> It seems like in northern Iraq, people just don't really loot much, whereas in Syria, they do. And this is particularly odd in northern Syria and Iraq because uh, the archaeological sites are very much the same. Like across that border, they're the same kind of sites, the same. What's different is, I don't know, the national boundary, the history of looting by local people, the perception that sites may or may not yield saleable artifacts. I, I don't know what explains this exactly. All I know is that it is a real fact. <clears throat> a big question that a lot of people have about 
this is related to ISIS, mostly because of the intense media coverage and also um, international attention paid to that particularly horrible group of people. Um, in 2015, you know, they started posting these kind of snuff films of archaeological destruction, like in the Mosul Museum where they smashed statuary and things like that. And this led to like a lot of intense interest and questions about ISIS's role in destruction of antiquities. I mean, it got to the point that um, it was basically like two things that people knew about ISIS, and one of them was that they destroyed antiquities. Like, this was a very widespread and understood phenomenon. Um, and this was intensified by the State Department, um, who uh, back in September of 2015, in a special event at the Met Museum in New York, the Under Secretary of State pictured here, released a series of documents in his speech that um, allegedly were seized during a raid on an ISIS compound in northern Syria and showed that ISIS had been overseeing looting and sort of sanctioning it. So there was like a, a bureaucratic department within ISIS administration that was issuing permits to people who were interested in looting with the agreement that a certain percentage of their fines, would, depending on what fines they were, would then be given back to the ISIS central admin or money instead. But um, so it, that's a particularly perverse uh, thing that we don't see other places. It's hard for me actually in thinking about this like to know whether that would actually result in more or less looting because um, you know, if you have to get a permit to do it, then maybe you're afraid to loot and you're going to get in trouble if you don't have the permit. And I don't know. Like it, it's different than an anarchic system. Anyway, we don't know like about it. But what I do know is that once this information came out that ISIS was looting and profiting from the sale of antiquities, then it was like impossible to stop the media from doing everything they could to link any looted object or any act of looting or antiquities destruction to ISIS. So this, for example, was a CBS news story, a really pretty good investigative journalism piece in which the reporter found an antiquities dealer in Istanbul, Turkey, who claimed to be selling a mosaic from the city of Apamea, the city that we saw at the beginning, the Roman one, that, remember, was looted in 2011 and 2012 before the existence of ISIS, and also located in a part of Syria that ISIS never was in, and in fact was occupied by the Syrian military <laughs> the entire time, right? So that's where this comes from, this mosaic. Um, and so you know, the reporter went there, and she talked to them, and found out how much it costs, and where it came from, and that part of the journalism was great. But then when it comes out like on TV, the whole thing is all about how it's ISIS. And it's like, it has nothing to do with ISIS. Like, this is the Syrian military that looted it and sold it to some guy in Turkey, and he's trying to fence it. Like, that's um, uh, it, so many other, even more ridiculous associations with ISIS, like in the well publicized story of Hobby Lobby's purchase of these um, illicit cuneiform tablets that you might have heard about. You know, they. The media, again, connects it to ISIS, even though these were looted from southern Iraq um, and were actually purchased by Hobby Lobby before the war in Syria started. So like, that's not, not related to ISIS. <laughs> yes, Middle Eastern antiquities, but the thing is that there is, um, you know, looting is an equal opportunity activity, and people all over the Middle East loot, and lots of people profit from it. So this is one thing that our data is able to address quantitatively, and that is like, is there more looting in ISIS-controlled areas of Syria than others? This is a map we just put together that's coming out in a paper next week in PLOS One, a journal. Um, so in it, we can see uh, mapping exactly where ISIS controls is a complicated matter because they have been progressively losing territory over the course of the last few years. So this data, which comes from um, uh, conflict monitor, a, a group that tries to map this thing. Um, you can see like the ISIS controlled areas as of 2017 and of course as of the last few days that's considerably reduced even more. But, uh, and that compares to their ability, you know, where they controlled as early as 2015. 
So anyway, the point is that, yes, there's a lot of looting in ISIS-controlled areas. You see some of the most severe looting along the Euphrates River and the Khabur River and the Balik River, too, near Raqqa. Like, so there's a lot of looting, yes, in ISIS areas. And the kind of severe looting you might expect if looting was sanctioned and permitted as an activity. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we see a whole lot of quite severe looting in this pocket in Western Syria. And those are almost uniformly at sites that are occupied and held by the Syrian military. So uh, these seem to be like the two worst players in terms of looting on a really severe, more industrial scale. Um, then we get a whole lot of like hundreds and hundreds of other sites with the more small scale aspirational looting that I talked about. And those occur most commonly both in Kurdish or in opposition controlled regions where there's the least sort of centralized authority and the least government control. So sort of what you'd expect where, you know, some people and their cousins go out for a few days and dig some holes, hope to find something. You know. um, anyway, so this is the kind of picture of things we can get. Another uh, big question that we've sought to address in this project is the um, timing of the looting, like when this damage has occurred over the course of the conflict. Um, this is a complicated chart, but basically the problem is that some sites we can say the looting occurred just like within a few month period, as in Tel Jafar on the left, where we can say within this five month window, we can say this happened. Whereas other sites like say, um, you know, Mari in the middle, because of the imagery window, we only get like a four year chunk. And we can say, well, this uh, looting took place sometime across a four year window. So we came up with a way of sort of uh, assessing the probability that this particular looting event might have taken place in this window. So in the case of Tel Jafar, we would say, well, there's a 20% chance that that looting took place in any of those five months. If you had a 10 month window, it would be a 10% chance and so forth. Um, this is put together across the whole data set to make a chart, this chart. that shows um, the total probable number of looting events per month over the course of a several year period during the war. And what's kind of interesting is that you can see there's this big spike in looting events in the middle during 2013 and early 2014. But after that, it really just sees a progressive drop off. And that is something that's held out throughout our analysis. That is over the course of the last couple of years, the severity and frequency of looting incidents has, has gradually declined. We don't know why that is. Uh, it could be because um, there's been so much out-migration, like the forced displacement of people inside Syria has been intense. Um, it might be because there's a saturation in the local antiquities market, like maybe nobody's buying this stuff. or I don't know why. All I know is that, the, yes, it's less looting. So I guess that's like sort of good news, maybe. The, the looting is like less, but it's countered by the fact that other forms of damage have become much more severe over that same time period. This is particularly true with uh, issues of militarization or related earth moving, like where they bulldoze bunkers and stuff like that. This map shows the location of all of these militarized sites that we've documented. There are hundreds of them, and um, they have gotten much worse. Like so, over the course of the conflict, especially in the last two years, we see more and more of these sites. So, like so, for example, my little site Tel Karkur, back in March of 2013, had been mostly abandoned. Those bunkers that were dug into it in 2011 are starting to erode over. However, <clears throat> by 2016, the whole top of the site was reoccupied by the Syrian military. And I know this because now I'm back in touch with our friends there. And they reported that the Syrians were on top of it. And they you know, completely demolished the thing with fortifications and roads and also a whole bunch of looting holes up on top of the mound. So. Um, that made me sad. And we see this same kind of thing, though, with the fortification and militarization of sites at many of the sort of hallmark sites of the region. Tel Sabi Abiyad, this famous Neolithic site up in northern Syria, uh, by 2016 was fortified, even though just a couple years earlier had been largely unscathed with uh, vehicle dugouts and a big road and fortifications. Um, the well-known city of Ebla in western Syria was one of the first to get fortified in November of 2012 with this little tiny Syrian military base inside the earthen fortification walls. Um, by 2014, those fortifications had been greatly expanded into a whole series of these bunkers around the site. And um, by 2017, the damage had become intense with uh, looting holes throughout the 
famous Bronze Age palatial compound at the middle and, you know, tank bunkers being dug into the 4,000-year-old city wall and so forth. So um, and we also see sites with construction, which is kind of weird because you don't really think of people building new houses and things like that during the course of a war, but nonetheless it happens. This is often the case in areas under ISIS control where, for instance, in downtown Raqqa, the Abbasid period palatial compound that was the only bit of it that was preserved over the course of the ISIS occupation in 2013 through the present um, has been largely covered with new house compounds. These might be the kinds of houses that they build for senior ISIS officers and officials, for example. We see the same thing at small sites with the construction of new houses frequently occurring in these sort of ISIS held areas. As at this site, Tel Sheikh Tatani, it was excavated by an Italian team and they told me that their village friends who live there say that the site was occupied by ISIS and then next thing you know there's a new house built. Um, and then finally we see a whole bunch of like ordnance damage very frequently like at this small site in eastern Syria where uh, much of the village of uh, it was largely destroyed during an aerial bombardment. Um, so you can see pockmarked craters all over the site and destroyed houses that sort of reminds us that we're not just looking at, um, you know, sites getting looted and destroyed, but this is like the destruction of people's livelihoods and homes. Okay, so I just want to close with a few things. Um, one of them is that uh, there's a lot of attention often paid to uh, recovery of the objects that are being stolen in the course of this looting, right? And returning them or repatriating them to their country of origin. Right now that's complicated because where would you send them and to whom in Syria? Presuming that some state emerges out of the mess that is that place now. Um, you could do that. A lot of these objects are getting seized by customs officials and authorities around the world, and you could like direct them back to Syria. But those objects will have lost the thing that for archaeology is the most important. I often tell my undergraduates in my lectures that archaeology is a lot like crime scene investigation, except in the ancient past. Like if you walked into a police station and just handed them a knife, they would be like, oh, I they're like, you guys always want knives, right? Here is a knife, I found this outside. Uh, no, look, the police wants is the knife like in the hand of the victim with the blood splatter and the fingerprints and like the receipt from the store. Like the, they want like the context, right? That allows you to build a story of an activity out of the physical evidence that remains. And this is exactly what we're doing, right? We're trying to like reconstruct what happened in the past based on the evidence, the stuff that people left behind except it's super old. Um, however, if you just take, the, the, once that stuff is lost, this contextual information, where it is, what it was found with, et cetera, like it's useless. It's like that random knife. Like it, it, um, so it's nice that you can recover some objects, but um, you know, museums around the world are filled with boxes of unprovenienced objects that have no context that are utterly worthless for anything except letting my undergrads play with in lab. Like they're, you know. Um, so can we do anything about this issue? I, I mean, there's a couple things. One that I always advocate for is that we should have stricter antiquities law, right? Um, this image is from eBay. If you search on eBay, you can find that they have an antiquities section, right? Where you can buy all kinds of antiquities, Viking, Egyptian, Mesopotamian. I pulled this off this morning. It's a cuneiform tablet, almost certainly looted. It has no provenience or anything else like that. Um, it's for sale, you know, just no, no biggie, right? And so th this is a problem. Uh, you shouldn't, you know what, if you wanna sell a piece of ivory that you have on display in your house, in America, that's against the law. You can't sell exotic animal parts. You can't import them into the country if you try to, they'll get taken at the airport. You also can't sell your kidneys. You're like, your kidneys, no against the law. And this is because we believe that certain things should be illegal to buy and sell because the ramifications of buying and selling them are bad. We don't want people being killed for their organs and we don't want elephants being slaughtered for their ivory, so we restrict the sale on those things. And the same should be true for antiquities. We should just make it illegal to buy and sell antiquities. Boom, big problem fixed. There's a lobby of people that don't like that, but those people I disagree with. There's. <laughs> okay, uh, one last thing, which is that there's other things that we can do because the war in Syria has been a terrible disaster in a humanitarian way in so many other respects.
But a big part of the challenge that we faced in going into that war at the beginning uh, as archaeologists is that we there was no um, existing database of archaeological sites. There was no inventory of what was there. There was no plan for how to manage it. Um, and the world is filled with places that could have similar things happen soon. This shows a risk map put together by a company, the results group, who tries to assess the likelihood of terrible things happening in different places in the world. You'll notice on this map that most of the places that are, I'm going to say green, I'm colorblind as we were discussing, America, Western Europe, these are the places with the best developed cultural heritage institutions, the most comprehensive databases of archaeology and cultural heritage remains, and also the places where it's least likely to have a problem. Um, so I would say that we should be investing more effort into developing databases and monitoring activities in places that aren't currently in a war but might be in the future. And this is something that is already starting to go on. The Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago is doing this in Afghanistan. My colleagues at ASOR are doing this in Libya. Um, and uh, there's a group of Europeans doing this for Syria, should they ever emerge out of the conflict. But there's a lot more of that kind of work that can be done. And you know, I think it, our work shows the importance of being prepared for that in the future. Anyway, that's all I got for now. Thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions. Um, hello, I actually read an article last year about how these satellite images were also being used to record the blueprints of these sites. Do you think that maybe after the war or maybe when ISIS is pushed out of the country, do you think these sites will be able to be rebuilt? Um. Well, a lot of the, you know, damage to actual structures, I mean, you can like try to rebuild some of that, but um, mostly once the original building is destroyed, it's, uh, you know, less exciting to build a reproduction of it. I mean, much more importantly, what the satellite imagery probably enables is for us to discover archaeological sites that we don't already know about and to facilitate archaeological research at them during peacetime. This is precisely, for example, what I'm doing in my project in Iraq, where we're documenting, in much the same way as I showed you here, hundreds of archaeological sites throughout our study region, and then we go and we visit them. And we can uh, map them, we can collect artifacts from the ground, and we can even excavate at them. And so, yeah, I think a lot of the work that's going on in Syria will certainly facilitate more work like that down the line. Hi, I have a question. Actually, two parts to it. One is, um, what are the collaborative projects with local archaeologists? What role do they play in preservation, stewardship, and so on and so forth? And the second one is, um, where, where, do we, where do we put a line as to where history ends and where history begins? I guess. So we're looking at all this, you know, the, the, the certain stages that are related to Christianity, maybe Judaism, maybe some Islam, but like contemporary, I don't know, contemporary monuments. I'm thinking about post-Soviet Russia where many monumental structures were destroyed. Oh, you mean like what should be preserved and what not? I mean... So, uh, regarding your first question, do you mean about Syria in particular or just in general in the region? Because in Syria right now, it is a difficult issue because um, for a lot of actors working with the Syrian regime, which still controls their own antiquities authority, is a problematic position to be in. And there's a lot of debate among archaeologists about the degree to whether we're willing to work with them or not. Like. Are you willing to work with Bashar al-Assad's government? And to some people, the answer to that is yes, and some people is no. I recognize it as a complicated question. Um, a lot of my colleagues have chosen, for example, only to work with opposition group archaeologists, of which there are many. And there was, for a time, a group of them based in Gaziantep. There was a, a research group based at the University of Pennsylvania that um, 
had a lot of connections with uh, opposition group people who had moved to Gaziantep in southern Turkey. And then they were working kind of across the border or with people still inside Syria. Uh, my colleagues at ASOR have a wide array of colleagues on the ground in Syria who quite secretly provide them information and whatever. Um, but I mean, until the actual shooting in Syria ends, most of these are in kind of like planning phases for a time when it becomes stable enough to get back there. Um, other parts of the Middle East, yeah, there's all kinds of collaborations that go on. And I work very closely with, for example, the Kurdish Antiquities Authority in our project in the Kurdish region. And, you know, everything we find goes to the museum and they work with us on a daily basis and so forth. Um, as far as the other thing, like, what, I mean, I, I tend to lean towards like preserving things rather than not, oh yeah, some like post-Soviet kind of architecture maybe is a little little harder to love, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, like uh, I was recently working with some uh, friends of mine who run a big archeological project outside of Joliet in Northern Illinois. And there they, they're working in a place called the National Prairie. It's like a national forest, except it's a prairie because there's no forest, it's a prairie. Anyway, so but in this region, they had, uh, built during World War II hundreds of these gigantic concrete bunkers where they kept all the bombs and munitions from the factories in Joliet. So they would produce them in Joliet and then they would ship them to these bunkers. And there's like, I don't know, like a hundred of these giant bunkers all over this field. And right now the US Forest Service is going through and demolishing all of the bunkers to try to turn it back into a prairie, which is what they think it should look like. And as an archeologist, I'm like offended by this because I think, you know, maybe you don't like the bunkers, but this is part of this place's history and they're kind of interesting and we should at least preserve some of them. <laughs> so, I mean, I tend to lean towards, you know, not destroying things, I guess. Hi. Gosh, I hate microphones. Um, so I think about uh, like the roles people play in looting at large a lot, um, not just in Syria, but um, buyers, distributors, and the people that loot. Yeah. And I wonder if you think, um, will looting ever be eradicated? And you talked about like a higher level le like legislation in America, but there's a lot of levels and a lot of different ways to talk about looting. And I wonder if yes. you think it'll come to an end. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, people are often interested in looting for the same reason that I am interested in archaeology, right? And uh, I mean, when I was a kid, I probably could have been classified as a looter in that I went around trying to dig stuff up and put it in a shoebox. <laughs> and I, I guess I think of this in a very grade way, right? So um, I, yeah, I don't think we're going to get rid of it. Uh, and I th what I was trying to illustrate in some of our data, though, is that there is this kind of like low level individual kind of what I called aspirational looting, which is the least damaging and the least problematic, right? And and because it, it, it's just a few little holes and it, yes, it's bad and it's good if you can try and stop that. But right now, more effort ought to be put to stopping the big, like those big looting episodes where an entire site has hundreds of looting holes that appear in an orderly fashion across you know, many, many hectares of the, like the huge area, that's not done by a few guys and their cousins. So, like that's done by somebody with a plan, with money, with a large group of employees, with machinery, and they probably also have dedicated buyers in place. Like, so those sites that were really badly damaged were done on a much bigger, more institutional way. Like that is, that's the kind of looting that you wanna like start with getting rid of. Um, Again, looting is a hard thing to control if you don't have any kind of regulatory authority on the ground. Like the Syrian government was quite good. It turns out from our data less good than Turkey or Iraq, but like pretty good at preventing looting. I mean, my site was looted one time while we were there. Well, not while we were there, but while we were gone. Like we came back one summer and there was some looting holes dug in it, which is annoying because I pay a guard while I'm not there to prevent this from happening. But I think it was actually him that did it. Anyway, whatever. I know. <laughs> he was not a very good guard. <laughs> he also bulldozed the site the next year we fired him. <laughs> Other questions? Hi. The um, administration's decision to um, 
back out of UNESCO. Yeah. Um, how does that affect your work? How, what is the impact for the U.S. or an archaeologist? Um, well, it's really unfortunate, of course. I mean, I, I am, as an archaeologist, in favor of any kind of international cooperation surrounding cultural heritage and archaeology, and UNESCO is an important player in that. Um, you know, will it have any direct... I mean, most of what UNESCO often does, though, is, is kind of more at a bigger level in terms of um, working with governments or big agencies to kind of develop strategic plans. Like, they're less often sort of on the ground, like doing the kind of like nitty gritty work maybe that, that I do. So uh, I imagine that UNESCO will continue doing all of those things that they do with or without US participation. And I hope that we'll eventually get back into supporting them. Um, thank you. I was, I, I understand for obvious reasons you're focusing on um, the, the last several years in terms of like, this is where your massive data set of looting, yeah. um, where it's coming from. But I was wondering, I'm fascinating that you're, you're sort of looking at, you also look at when sites that had looting prior to the, uh, Civil War, and I was wondering if you have any sense of like the chronology of that prior looting, like if yeah. you know it's a 20th century. I mean, some of these sites, as you said, no, are that's like a, good a question. long time. It's hard to assess because like uh, our imagery availability, like so the first commercial high resolution images, like the first like like say two meter resolution images that you could buy or that I could buy was in 1999, um, and at that scale, even it's actually pretty difficult to recognize looting. Um, in most images. It's really not until like the late aughts, like 2009, 2010, when we start getting sub-meter. So images that have like better than one meter resolution, more commonly available. And what, at that point, then you can really start seeing a lot more that we couldn't see earlier. So like the further, and like the corona that I show, best case scenario is like two meters. Um, and that means that it's hard to see looting. <laughs> so, like, because a lot of these looting holes are like one meter or like two meters. And so it's like one pixel in these images. So sometimes, if you're lucky, you can see it. Um, but so, most the short answer is that it's hard to know. Uh, what I have been able to do with what we have seen is to say that um, there are episodes of looting that I can see today that are at least 15 years old ish, you know? So that means probably the pre-war looting record combines at least a couple decades. I mean, because over time, a looting hole will become less and less visible as it like fills in and erodes. So how long can you say? I don't know. A couple decades, probably. So, um, hey, um, I have two questions. Uh, so one is that you mentioned uh, um, this looting of artifacts is uh, universal in Middle Eastern sites. Yeah. So uh, um, besides um, the Syrian and uh, ISIS armies, did Kurds also participate in the looting? Yeah, I mean, you know, people used to ask me who's doing the looting in Syria, and my question, the answer would be like everyone with a shovel, right? Like it's just. Uh, I mean, it's ubiquitous, even today. You know, people believe very firmly that uh, certain sites will produce gold. This is the thing. They're generally just looking for gold. And this belief is impossible to shake from them. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that show. There's a British sitcom called uh, Detectorists. Have you seen this? It's, check it out. It's like on Netflix. It's funny. It's like a comedy, anyway, but it's about these uh, British guys that go around with metal detectors. And they are singularly focused on the discovery of gold. They want to find gold, right? They never do. Like, this is just like, it's not, I don't want to, I won't give away much by telling you that they, there's not a lot of, they find a lot of bottle caps and fish hooks and whatever, but they don't find a lot of gold. And the same is true for a lot of the looting, I think, that we see in the Middle East, where people go out there and they dig holes and they, they think they might find gold. And maybe once in a while somebody does. And man, if somebody finds gold on a site, then everybody and their brother is out on that thing, digging it up, hoping to find more. And then maybe someone else does, because you will do, if occasionally you find gold in these sites, right? And if a couple people find gold, then there is a local belief that that is the place to dig. And a lot of times, actually, people I meet there will tell me, as an archaeologist, they'll say, Jesse, you're, you're digging on the wrong site, man. 
that one over there, that's where the gold is. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Just like in hushed tones. And I'm like, guys, you know, we're really not trying to find gold. Like, that's not. But that is a very hard thing to dissuade them of. Um, so, yeah, as long as they believe that they might find gold, which, as far as I can tell, is a universal belief among relic hunters or looters or whatever you want to call them, um, they'll keep digging. <laughs> we, that's a manageable problem, though, you know. Yeah. So. so, my second question is. Um, so the uh, looting caused by military occupation, yeah. it's, um, just in my understanding, it's uh, not about, I mean, the moral part of the question, because it's always been the tradition of many armies to take loots and um, trophies yeah. at the, you know, whatever they go. Um, this is, was still the case, uh, this was the case for the army, for example, a thousand years ago for wh whoever, Assyrians, Babylonians, or yeah. even Greeks, they, they do all these kind of stuff. So, um, is it, you think it's because of, uh, like, in a modern day, since we are all modernized army, so is this looting thing should be more, um, I mean, restricted uh, by disciplines, or it's, uh, I mean, like, what is the... Um, tough time articulating the question. So um, do you think it is possible, I mean, like through the mean of discipline, that modern army can really eliminate this habit or tradition of taking the loots? Yes, yes, absolutely. But any well-disciplined army doesn't like rampantly loot archeological sites. And they shouldn't be camped out on these things to begin with. I mean, this is like a, one of the most shameful parts of the looting that we've documented because they're not looting a foreign like set of, they didn't like invade somewhere and take their stuff. These are sites within their own country. Like these are the sites that they're tasked with protecting along with everything else. And they're the, the official military of the Syrian regime, the government of Syria that also has a, a you know directorate of antiquities and laws that say it's illegal to do that these people are breaking the law in their own country and they're getting away with it because it's corrupt um yeah they should totally be stopped like those that that would, that's easy to stop there's it, almost all of those incidences of Syrian military related looting are also pretty tightly clustered in one part of Western Syria. So it's not hard to deduce that there's probably like a, a small cadre of bad actors facilitating that. Um, but so far, nothing has changed in that score. Yeah, it's terrible. They shouldn't do that. Yes. Hi. Um, so I was uh, wondering how these uh, excavation sites look after, um, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. The mic is kind of fun. You just yeah. So uh, what I was wondering is between like erosion and human damages of these sites, like how long do you think that it will be till these sites are like no longer even able to look at or uh, excavate at all? I mean, oh. you've seen them before. These sites are durable features. I mean, a lot of these sites that I'm showing you, these are you know thousands, many thousands of years old. Sabi Abiyad was occupied 8,000 years ago, right? I mean, it still forms a mound. They're pretty resilient. I mean, unless you get machinery in there. Um, I think we have time for like two more questions. So one here, anyone else want the microphone? Okay, go ahead, please. So I had to ask a question. Has your research also um, involved Iran as well and just Looking at after like the revolution 1979 when the um, Ayatollah Khomeini took power and how there was also a lot of looting that also happened when the Shah left power. I mean, um, can we can we also, I guess, look at other countries too and see that this history goes far back, not just it's not just contemporary. But, Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I just wonder if you if you have I, I want to know if you have any research about that because I'm kind of curious about learning about kind of that research as well. Yeah, I mean, I haven't uh, done this kind of a study in Iran specifically. And like I was saying before, approaching it through this method would be difficult because we simply don't have imagery more than, you know, 15 years old or so. Um, 
However, yeah, I mean, basically, the, the rule that we see, not just in the Middle East, but throughout many parts of the world, is that in the absence of a central authority that prevents sites from being looted, so as soon as there's a breakdown in civil authority, there's going to be a lot of looting, and that is easy to predict. Like, that will probably happen. And so, yes, that probably occurred, certainly in Iran. A much bigger thing that we have seen happen in Iran that I have done a little bit of work on relates to the massive changes in land use that came following the Iranian Revolution. So uh, in the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s, they instituted huge uh, new irrigation schemes, for example, throughout large parts of Khuzestan in southwestern Iran, where thousands of archaeological sites and other kinds of ancient landscape features like ancient canals or roads or other stuff have been obliterated. I mean, not for no reason. It's to make way for more productive agriculture. But um, those kinds of land use threats are actually a much more significant problem in terms of erasing archaeological sites. Like, uh, so that's a big thing that's happened in Iran a lot. To my understanding, your research covers mostly Syria. Have you done research of the same kind in other parts of the world before, or is this the first time? I mean, I have spent most of my career focusing on the Middle East, and specifically the sort of fertile crescent, so Syria, southern Turkey, and now northern Iraq and stuff. Um, but I think that this same kind of approach could certainly be taken uh, by lots of people other places. Archaeologists are pretty parochial in terms of our regional interests usually because it takes so long to sort of learn the specifics and unique history of the place where you're working and shifting. You know, I mean I spent like four years learning to read cuneiform. Like what you know, like I could like jump ship and go to the American Southwest, which sounds nice right now, I gotta be honest. <laughs> like I love New Mexico, but it would be like a, a big, a big <laughs> undertaking to relearn all that. Yeah. I lied, we have one more question okay. from Professor Howie. So oh, okay. from we'll chairman. It's good because it's about America versus do you ever see any irony that the U.S. government is so invested in understanding the looting in the Middle East when the history of our country is we plowed over sites that were just as big as these tells with no mention, with no care, with no discussion? And it's this weird irony that in today's age we love to judge, uh, you know, this other, and we're obsessed with this kind of Middle East high culture. Uh, I mean, I don't... I'm not sure how to answer that. No, I mean, yes, uh, people, wherever there has been development of any sort, uh, the growth of cities, the introduction of more intensive forms of agriculture, dam construction, anything like, like that is devastating to the archaeological record. And that is something I tried to allude to and mention a few times in this discussion, that yes, like uh, those things are the biggest problem. And the, it's the least, like, you know, like headline worthy to report on, like intensive agriculture makes it harder to see this old pot that I found. Like that's that's like a less like you know clickbait kind of headline. But um, but yeah, it's a it's a big problem here. It's a big problem there. It's a it's a big problem throughout the world. In our new uh, this Corona Atlas project that um, was mentioned briefly, uh, I've done a lot of work using this old 1960s imagery to map this kind of change in the Middle East. But I uh, just want to if I can plug on my way out, you should check out the Corona Atlas. It's uh, easy to find. Just Google Corona Atlas. And uh, right now, it's a bunch of Middle East data. But in the coming months, we're going global with it. So we're going to be posting imagery for uh, China, South and Central Asia, Eastern Europe, the African Sahel, and yes, interesting parts of the Americas, by which I mean Mexico and the Andes. But there, there we're progressively adding more and more imagery, so including in North America and elsewhere. So uh, I think that'll be a really valuable resource for looking at exactly the kinds of issues you're talking about, because it gives us this 50-year-old baseline to look at development against. So. Before we uh, thank Professor Kassan again, I have two things quickly to mention. One. You'll notice behind me there's a lot of food mm. and drink, so please partake liberally from this. And second, uh, for those of you who are students here, we are offering next semester an honor symposium around this question of who owns the past. So if you're interested in pursuing these uh, items further, please be on the lookout for those classes, um, and you can go to the honors uh, office to find out the exact nature of those um, classes. But please join me in thanking Professor Kasana for a stimulating talk. Thank you.